How you doing, folks? I'm Huey Morgan, Fun Loving Criminals, uh, guitar player, and this is a very humble message to all you guitar players about the stuff that I listened to when I was a youngster. Yeah, Van Halen 1 was a game changer in a lot of ways. It's kind of like, you know, when I first listened to Jimi Hendrix, it was one of those things where he definitely brought guitar to a different level. I mean, it was a lot of stuff that people were kind of trying to do, and this guy just epitomized it. It had a lot of blues feel which a lot of people tried to copy and they didn't get the blues part of it. It was all about all the technique and stuff like that. But he had this like this really kind of humor and blues involved in all these, these I guess, tricks that he was doing. But for me, I actually caught the blues end of it. And that was really important to me. And that whole, the whole thing with, you know, David Lee Roth, they were just a great band. And then that guitar playing was just second to none. And Ted Templeman, who produced it, the way you've listened to it on headphones, you listen to it on speakers, the guitar is all on, on one side, which is kind of great. So if you have like one speaker, you just pan everything over there and you get total Van Halen. We got a favorite track? Uh, you know, I, I always like Ice Cream Man because it's an old blues cover. And just the way they kind of, you know, David Lee Roth plays the acoustic and then Nate Van Halen just comes in and slams it. It's cool where he just bops it and you can really feel that he knows what he's doing with blues because it's, it's one of those things where it's, it's easy to kind of play, but it's not easy to feel. So when you hear him do that, you kind of go, oh, the guy knows what he's doing. And that's on the first record. I think it's the last track on the record. Uh, yeah. yeah, and it's just a great record. He's he's one of the greats, man, definitely. Yeah, well, I mean, there's nothing you can say about that that hasn't been said already. I mean, it's one of those things, I think, uh, the first time I heard it, I was kind of playing guitar. So I was probably like eight, eight or nine, and a friend of mine was like, have you heard this? Because his brother was a big you know, Zeppelin fan and we'd sat and listened to it and we were just kind of scared and amazed by it. And I think that's kind of what Led Zeppelin did. They kind of put the fear of God in people that thought they knew what blues was about. And that's kind of cool because they had that, that kind of like overt mysticism going on. But the guitar playing is just, I mean, obviously Jimmy Page, one of the best too, but he just did stuff that was just so on point. Even though he borrowed a lot of technique, that's kind of the idea. You're supposed to kind of evolve at the blues, you know? Favorite track? Well, I mean, I, I, the thing is like on albums, cause I'm an old dude, I listen to albums and I think like an album is like a complete thought. But if I had to pick something like Dazed and Confused was just kind of bizarre. I mean, but that record so much stuff on it. I mean, every song on that record is a potential single if they did them back then. So I just say the whole record. That's why you, you ask me for a record, I give you a record. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people don't think of now Rogers as a badass guitar player. Especially where I grew up, that was a lot, there was a lot of stuff going on as far as different styles of music in Lower East Side of Manhattan. You had everything going on. It was just it was an immigrant neighborhood, so you had like Spanish music and rock music and metal music and rock and roll and and dance music. And Niall, who later I found out like played with Jimi Hendrix and was a session guy and stuff like that. When I first heard it, the guitar is very prevalent in the mixes and stuff because he's obviously one of the producers. And then you listen to Savoir Faire. And it's like a five and a half minute guitar solo. And you hear him kind of let loose every once in a while. Like he just tosses you stuff like, oh, I can do this. And you're like, whoa. And it kind of takes you aside and goes, hey, look, this guy can really play. And that's the important part about that is that being a guitar player, especially if you're in a band, it's not all about you. It's about the song. That's how I've always thought of stuff. And if you're playing a song and you're doing what the song requires, that's cool. You can also shred in a guitar store, but that's what it is. You know, you can kind of go up and down the neck like Ingve. And that's impressive, but if it doesn't support the song, it's not really worth shit. So that's what I kind of took from Niall, was it's all about the song, and you can kind of do stuff that's completely unique, like that whole little, you know, octave chord thing that he does. That's him. He made that shit up. And, you know, the production that he's done, like obviously David Bowie's Let's Dance, but also the family style by the Vaughn Brothers. That's like a... And he could tell he loves guitarists, right? And he's a great guitarist himself. So if he's, if he's doing records with Steve Ray Vaughn and his Jimmy, it's like... That's a that's probably the best record, I'd say arguably the best record next to like Alive Alive or something like that from Stevie Ray, that Stevie Ray's played on just because it's just so well put together. Yeah, that's pretty much all you gotta say. Are you? <laughs> <laughs> you are after you listen to that. Yeah, that's it's a mind bender for like a young player to kind of listen to that, and even if you know like the pentatonic box or a couple chords and stuff like that you listen to that and that's what that guy's doing, but he's from outer space, man. He's just coming with something that no one thought of before. You know, I mean, it's not just the uh, the overdrive or just bending the notes on top of the neck or anything like that. He was just, he was probably the most amazing talent on the guitar ever. You know, a guy that just brought it. And like I said, the involvement of the blues. I mean, he obviously listened to Albert King, who's on my list as well. Mm. And that, I think that concert was actually him opening up for Jimmy, the live in San Francisco in 69. I think it was. I'm, I'm not too sure, but you could tell with that, I mean, how Jimmy was really 
paying homage to all these cats that came before him and just naturally took it to that next plane of reality because he was looking at, you know, the 1960s with, with pretty much not rosy colored glasses. He was, you know, an ex-paratrooper. So he had, you know, a lot of a lot of things to reconcile within himself. And I think he did a good job of it with his guitar playing. Can you remember the first time you heard it? Oh yeah, uh, I remember hearing, I think it was this movie called Heavy Metal. It was like this kind of pseudo illustrated kind of cartoon thing, but had like motion capture and stuff. And there was like a Jimi Hendrix I think it might have been Purple Haze, actually, that was playing in it. And it just stood out from that whole record, uh, that whole movie, actually. And I just walked out and, and just having that in my head and just being, you know, wh whoever this guy is, I got I to gotta find more about him, you know. And that kind of took me on my personal, my personal voyage to meet Jimi Hendrix on his, on his records. Yeah, a lot of people, you know, especially where I grew up, didn't know who Roy Gallagher was. I mean, I'm going to say Roy Gallagher over here, but I'm going to go to New York with you. Roy Gallagher. This guy was just a monster. And a friend of mine who kind of was a little older than me, who taught me like some chords and taught me the pentatonic scale and things like that, was always into like playing stuff that wasn't necessarily guitar based, but this one was. And he played me that top priority record. And, you know, Follow Me, for example, when he just goes into that solo, it's like, whoa, can you follow him? I mean, I'm lucky the bass and the drummer could follow him because it was, that's some heavy recording. I mean, I don't know how he did that. That's some incredible stuff. And you see pictures of him playing live and stuff. You could tell he was just loving every minute he was live. One of the best records ever. Yeah, B.B. King was one of the three kings of the blues, man. I mean, I, I was lucky enough to meet the dude. And he played on one of our tracks on our second record. And you know, he was just an amazing guy. Actually, the Chet Atkins, I was doing Jules Holland. And he, we were after, after they do the sound check, and we're kind of just dicking around. And he's like, hey, son, come over here. And I was like, oh, put my guitar. He's like, no, bring the guitar. And it's a great story. So I bring over the guitar and he just hands me Lucille. And I got Lucille like this, hands me Lucille. And I'm like, I'm holding it like this. He's like, hold it like a woman. I was like, okay. So I'm holding Lucille <laughs> like this. He's playing this thing. So he's just like. And I'm like, wow. And he goes, what kind of guitar is this? And I was like, uh, it's mine. <laughs> I'm like just completely flabbergasted. because It's B.B. King talking to you. And I was like, I called him Mr. King. And he's like, no, Mr. King was a prophet. My name's B.B. And I was like, uh, uh, and it just kind of like bounced on inside of my head. I'm like, ding, 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 like a pinball, right? And I was like, oh, it's a Chet actor. Oh, I like Chet. He's a good guy. And I just realized that I'm actually having an audience with probably one of the greatest players that has ever lived. So I kind of cooled it down, you know, took a chill pill. I was like, <laughs> started breathing right. Because you get in a room with someone like that and you're like, or the situation where you're actually talking to him, it's flabbergasted. You know, you're just like, <sighs> But he was really nice. That's the great thing about guys like that. And when you meet dudes that are legends like that and they're really nice and you can tell like, wow, they're gentlemen. That's like a really cool thing to kind of take away. You know, don't ask for a selfie. You get five minutes at a time and they're right, really nice guys and they have time for people that play guitar. That's amazing. That was the record I think that he was opening up for Jimi Hendrix. Because if you listen to it, he's playing. I think it's like the Fillmore West or something. He's playing and after like the first song, Everybody goes bananas, and he's kind of taking me. He's like, "Thank you, thank you very much." And it's it's kind of like he's looking at the band, like, "What the fuck?" <laughs> you know, because I mean, up to that point, that was like you know mid '60s. It was in late '60s, '69, I think it was. So those guys were just starting to get a nod from all the blues guys, like Clapton and Page and Beck and Hendrix, and it, they were starting to get a props for what they brought to the table. And he was one of the best players ever. So also keep, keep in mind, he's playing a V upside down not strung lefty. So he's playing it with the, the little strings on the top, bending it down like that. I mean, just incredible player. Another guy who just ripped that phrasing together. I mean, he could play Stormy Monday for 15 minutes and you're on that, you're on that voyage with him every step of the way. Fantastic record. Just, he hits all his, he hits all his marks, man. Fantastic. If you, if you want to learn how to play the blues, the Regal and live in San Francisco, that's a good place to start. That was the one from my youth. And I, the friend I was talking about who turned me on to a lot of music that wasn't necessarily guitar driven, but was, I guess, avant-garde, but also let you think outside the box as instrumentalist. If you're a guitar player and you listen to 801, you know, the cat from Roxy Music Phil's playing guitar, but it's not like completely guitar driven. I mean, it was a record I used to listen to when I was kind of thinking about playing stuff or, or actually, I was probably thinking about it when I realized I was playing stuff other, other people were playing. So if you, you're playing like a blues bar or something like that, and you kind of realize that you're, 
you're coming into things the same way a lot of other cats do, or you're going down the road a lot of other, other cats do, playing those kind of, those riffs that you know work. And if you listen to 801 Live, there's a whole dictionary of stuff that you can just get into and realize that it doesn't have to be pentatonic, it doesn't have to be diatonic. You can just kind of spin the globe around, just pop a spot and just go with it there. And I think Brian Eno is probably one of the greatest minds in music. And I, being in a band with him, I pretty much had to be pretty good, you know? Yeah, I love yeah. Um, Babies on Fire. Yeah, that's a track I can't play on the BBC. Really? Yeah. Why not? Apparently it could be offensive if taken the wrong way. <laughs> it's okay. true, I don't know. But it's true, I mean, I tried to play it one time because I, I think Brian Eno was doing something on the on the station and I love that record he did with Brian, no, it was with uh, uh, David Byrne, My Life in the mm -hmm. Bush of Ghosts, mm -hmm. for especially for the band that I play, The Criminals. I got that record and it's all these, he pretty much goes out and audio tapes like an exorcism, a Lebanese mountain singer, brings all that shit back and then like creates grooves around it. And it's a whole record of amazing stuff like that before samples where you can just go up through your phone and just kind of do that. Yeah. But like, you know, I wanted to play Babies on Fire because Robert Fripp is just destroying that on that record. He's like, Rrr. and they said, no, you can't play that, man. I was like, why not? Because it could be offensive to some people. So, mm. so could Coldplay. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> but they play them motherfuckers. <laughs> I like jazz music for a lot of reasons. I come from New York, and it's kind of like where jazz kind of found its home after it kind of came from Chicago and New Orleans and stuff. But the reason I like that stuff is because when I first listened to it, I had no idea what they were doing. No, no touchstone, no map, no waypoint. It was just stuff that I didn't grow up on. And I didn't really know what they were doing. Now, later on, you learn how to play jazz and stuff. And you realize that it's all about up here rather than like, you know, scales and things like that. So when I listen to Miles, it's just one of those things where you could say bitches brew and things like that. But I like going back when he first actually switched jazz up from being like kind of a big band kind of swing thing to what he decided jazz was going to be. And that's kind of a great thing to do when you're trying to be a musician, and try to do original stuff is go to somebody who actually did just flip it on its ear. And that record in particular just took music, especially that whole kind of jazz, jazz guy thing, and just made it completely new. And that's one of the things I liked about him. And I, the fact that he was really good at what he did and kind of took, took everything that he knew and just threw it out and just started again. And he did that a couple times in his career. You know, I think that's kind of an important thing to do if you're trying to be creative is kind of not think about what you've done, but think about what you can do. And even if it's not comfortable, and that's the kind of thing I like about that record, it's not comfortable to listen to when you're 10 years old because <laughs> you're like, what the hell's going on? And that's kind of cool because once you realize that you don't know what's going on, then all the doors open. That was a record that a friend gave me because that's what Mick Jagger had under his arm when he met Keith Richards. And that's the record that kind of brought them together, right? It's the blue one with his face on it. And... Aside from, you know, me being a real lover of the blues, that's a great dictionary to have if you want to play blues music. Because everybody's doing something that's on the same page. It's like not not some guy is a great guitar player and the rest of the band is just kind of backing him up. It's everybody's on the same page. And that record in particular, although it's a greatest hits record, is a great, you know, it's a great collection of American blues music. Especially like that kind of just early electric blues. And I remember I talked to Keith Richards about that record. He was like, yeah, man, that's, that's it, man. That's the record. And if he's saying that, I don't need to talk too much more about it, right? No, I mean, the, kind of the thing I used to do when I was first learning how to play, especially when I first kind of knew the basics of like, you know, the pentatonic scale and bending notes and little chord things, is that I try to play to the radio. So I put on like a top 40 station and literally go up the neck, do, 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 until I got the key of the song that whatever it was on the radio, if my guitar was a little flat or sharp, or whatever. And then I play to that song. And then I have special songs I liked and albums that I liked, but I always kept them kind of sacrosanct in a lot of ways. You know, like, I don't really want to know. I mean, you learn Zeppelin riffs and stuff like that, and you can kind of fiddle around stuff, but I never really got into actually copying people's playing because it seemed to me that that was what they did. And not saying I do what I do, but I kind of do what I do. And I didn't want to have that all in my head you know, it was kind of weird. You want to keep a lot of space because I'm, I'm a cassette guy. A lot of people have hard drives in their brain. I got a cassette. There's only 60 minutes on that cassette. So if I put a whole bunch of stuff on it, ain't much room for Huey. So uh, that, that's one of the things, I mean, it, over the years, like, you know, you learn Van Halen's eruption and stuff like that for kicks, you know, when you're a kid and stuff. But I probably forgot most of it. Uh, but I, I, I kind of want to see them play more. 
but these guys have passed away. So you can check them on YouTube or something like that. You can't see what they're doing, but a lot of times you see them and you're just like, I don't even want to mess with that. I mean, you know, so I think I kind of kept my distance from learning actual like, you know, passages and solos and stuff like that. But you can take little tips from people, like how they approach a phrase. Because I always thought phrasing was important when you're soloing. Like you have to know where you're going and know when you're stopping. Because you, know, you play in a blues band. I play in a blues band in New York and I play pedal steel, lap steel. I don't play pedal steel, trust me. <laughs> but I play lap steel and if I get a break, it's eight bars and then I'll start repeating myself. Because that's so much you can do on a pedal steel or a lap steel rather. So, I mean, I always thought that phrasing was really important. So you definitely get nods from those guys, like this is how you approach solo, this is what you do and how you end it and stuff like that. And in the, in the middle, obviously, a lot of those guys are improvising. So that's kind of cool that that's just coming from their head to their fingers. And I think that's kind of the channel that I tried to get. I didn't actually try to figure out what exactly they were playing, but just have that freedom that you kind of know what's in your head will come out of your hands if you kind of just let everything go. Mm -hmm.